just a moment so I can, uh, before I turn to you for the reading, okay? Well, thank you so much, musicians. Here's a question this morning. Who do you think is the most important person in your life? Um, now, you'll be quick to say, well, uh, my dad, my mom, uh, my Sunday school teacher, uh, my pastor. My seventh grade teacher, other than Jesus, Jesus, human and divine, humanly speaking, to whom might you have and I with you the greatest debt of gratitude? As, as a Christian, not just in life, I don't mean the guy who taught you to swim or play tennis. Spiritually, the most important person in our lives is the apostle, was and is, was the apostle Paul. I, I could make the argument that without Paul we are totally puzzled at Jesus. The Holy Spirit used the Apostle Paul in the most remarkable of ways, and we'll be talking about him this morning, Saul, who became Paul. And we're not here to exalt any of the saints, any of the early Christians, that's for sure, but we do want to talk about this man, Paul, and his incredible conversion experience. Pastor Winans and I have been bouncing the pulpit back and forth, talking about life-changing events and talking about the impact of life upon us, talking about transition, and Paul is the quintessential, almost perfect example of a man whose life was transitioned by the grace of God. So I just want to lay that as a foundation. The screen, please, I want to ask you another question. Um, go to, um, if you would, please, there we go. In January of 1992, this pulpit began a series of sermons. Sounds like a quiz show, doesn't it? What was the name of that series? Now, if you happen to know, which will surprise me immensely, if you happen to know, please don't say it out loud, but how many of you were even here in January of 1992? Just, just a few of you. You look well for older people. Okay. <laughs> Some weren't even born by then. That is true. Hold on to that question, but I'll give you a hint. It had to do with Jesus who changes lives. That, that's what I want to talk about this morning for a little while. Jesus changes lives. I mean, he comes to this woman at the well and he shocks her. He says, could I share your ladle? Would you give me a drink? And she says, what? They bring another woman to him who's been caught in adultery. She's humiliated and embarrassed looking down and he, he helps her up. And he basically saves her. Jesus goes around changing lives. Remember the guy that was off to the side of the road and he's blind and he's got his cloak around him and that's all he has probably. He's a poor man. He's blind. He's got his cloak. And it says, he, he's yelling to Jesus. And Jesus says, oh, bring that guy over here. Bring him over here. And they're telling him, be quiet, be quiet. And Jesus says, bring him over here. And then it says, casting off his cloak. It, not just running out from it, throwing it away like that. Now, if you were a blind pauper, would you throw your cloak in the dirt, in the middle of a couple thousand people, and Jesus is about 100 yards away, and he's screaming to him, if he's not healed, will he ever get that cloak back? What is he thinking about? Why did he do that? Why does the text bother to tell us he cast off his cloak? It's not just a metaphor. Well, the cloak is a symbol for his life. Sure, the guy is poor. It's probably all he has. Let's pray together. We'll talk more about Jesus. Father in heaven, we thank you for your mercies, and we pray that you will make some good use of this little while. If there's someone who doesn't know you, then let that heart be opened and that mind made clear to see the gospel. Open eyes this day, Holy Spirit of God, and have mercy upon me when I say something not helpful. I pray you would bring it to nothing and quickly. We pray in his name. Amen. Stand for our moment of learning together, please, and then we'll turn to Pastor Treaty for the text. Our question this morning is this, what did Paul say about the change in a person who comes to Christ? Allow me to read our response, it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul said, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Now we don't always feel that way. In fact, sometimes we feel much more like part of the old creation, the unchanged person. But the scripture is declaring when the Holy Spirit comes to reside within us, we are made new. It may take a while for all that to be manifest, you know, for the car to get polished and look like it should, but we're new. So the question is, what did Paul say about the change in a person who comes to Christ? Together, please. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, 
the new has come. Please remain standing for a reading. Sir. Our text is taken from Acts 9, beginning at verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. May the Lord bless our time in his word. Please be seated. car, passing people, heading towards some ultimate destination, not sure how far out there it is, going a little too fast, and then sometimes, let's face it, we run off the road, the tires slip off the edge, or we slam into somebody from the front, from the back, and our life is really transitioned. It does feel like a race a lot of the time. Christmas Eve comes, uh, of course, once a year, and many families celebrate in special ways over and over again. In our house, we usually celebrate a little bit late because I think for the last 30 plus years I've worked on Christmas Eve, that's not a complaint. I'm just saying we tend to get home about 9.30 or 10 o'clock and we're a little bit uh, tired. So we watch a very meaningful movie or we listen to a wonderful symphony. But our most meaningful movie, of course, that we like to watch on Christmas Eve is Trains, Planes, and Automobiles. <laughs> with Steve Martin and uh, John Candy. I mean, how many of you know that movie? I mean, that's just a great movie. I mean, it's got some seedy parts, but you gotta laugh. It, it's lots of fun. In particular, I like that scene where the two guys have the, uh, up on the left there, they've got this Chrysler convertible. It started out very beautiful and shiny. And of course, by now it's been in a fire and they've driven into a couple of walls and they ran through the window of the motel with it. And they're riding down the road. You remember that scene? They're driving along. And, they're on the highway and they're in the wrong side, they're going the wrong way. They're going into the traffic and the other drivers are yelling at them, you're going the wrong way, you're going the wrong way. Anybody remember that scene? And John Candy's saying, how does he know which way we're going? <laughs> how would he know what's the wrong way? He doesn't know where we're headed. <laughs> it's, just a, it's just a great scene. And I think that, that's really funny. And I think that sometimes, you know, look at Steve Martin's face in the picture there. I think there are times when we're going the wrong way and we don't know it. And I hear the Lord saying, you know, you're going in the wrong way. You want to think about that. How long do you want to drive the wrong way? When you come to a passage like this one that Pastor read in, in, chap, in Acts chapter 9, you can actually talk about it for hours or preach a whole sermon series on it. There's a lot of ways to approach the pulpit. One is the immediate and the practical way to say, well, what does this do? You know, what can you learn about your emotions? How can you communicate better with your kids? And all of those are good things. Those are not fine. But sometimes we look at that immediate application at the expense of looking at the bigger themes that are there. The main purpose of the pulpit, as I understand it, is to help God's people understand God better. That was the great statement that Carlisle made to the new young pastor. He said, this town needs someone who knows God other than by hearsay. What can we learn about God and transition in life from Paul's experience? Put another way, in our own transitions, with our gains and our losses, those we love, those who move on, changes in our life, in our work, in our house, in our work, in our church, transition. So let's think then a little bit about what God would show us that we can deduce, infer, from the life of the Apostle Paul, who, by the way, was named Saul initially, 
There's no big drama here. How did he become Paul? Saul is a Hebrew name. When he becomes a Christian and the apostle to the Gentiles, he uses his Roman name, which is Paul. You pick that up in Acts 13, so there's no big mystery there. And he becomes the man that we know as Paul. Now, it's practical. It's practical in that there's Paul driving one of those race cars, going like a rocket, but he's driving carelessly and he's about to crash. Prior to his crash, he had explained he was a leader of the Hebrews. It says, if anyone else thinks that he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin. In other words, his Jewish pedigree was such that he's an absolute all-star. There's no question among the Jews. They could never say, well, he wasn't a real Jew. That's not true. He certainly was. He goes on to say, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews in regard to the law of Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for legalistic righteousness, I was faultless. In other words, he's setting the stage to explain that he was at the top of the religious hierarchy. He was the most religious man in ancient Israel, perhaps, and he was actually a godless, brutal man. Couldn't have lived a life less pleasing to God than did Paul. Now, a couple of chapters earlier, in the seventh chapter of Acts, we meet a man named Stephen. Stephen is without regard to his own safety. He is speaking to a bunch of the Jewish leaders, and he's not pulling any punches. He's telling them how they missed out on the Messiah who came to be among them because they're so interested in their rules and in their laws, he, they had absolutely no sense of how to even recognize him when he came. So he says this to them, you stiff-necked people. Not a good way to start out. <laughs> Uncircumcised hearts, what's he mean by that? Your fleshly nature in your heart is still there, You're just like your father's. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Now picture the most august and impressive group of long-robed clergy hearing something like this in front of everyone. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was put into effect to angels, but you never obey it. Well, now they're gnashing their teeth. They just want to get at him. They want to execute him. They want to strangle him and stone him. They can't wait to kill him. This is how spiritual these people really are. But the thing is that Saul, who became Paul, is there with them. And he's the guy watching over their robes and cloaks and giving approval, it says. Saul was there giving approval to his death. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. God allows his own people to suffer. We're reminded of that, aren't we? In fact, let's tell the truth. We may not say it out loud, but... It's pretty regularly that we think, why has God allowed this into my life, our life? We pastors say, you know, Lord, what are you doing with this person? This is just worse than worse. There's suffering to be had, but especially that was true in the first century. All of these brutal things that happened to the young Christians, however, prompted them to be scattered. That's the meaning of the word diaspora, to send out. And those seeds were scattered like seeds thrown into the wind, and then the crops come up here and there. Their blood became the source of fertilization, if you will, of seeding for the gospel. In the second century, the church leader Tertullian said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So while you're thinking, well, if God was really on the job, he wouldn't have let Saul, Paul, and others persecute people. Even today, there are more Christians being persecuted in the world, especially in the Middle East, than at any time in history. They're being separated from their families. They're being martyred, beheaded, brutalized, raped, and tortured, sold without any sense of conscience, brutalization of God's people. And so when we study Saul, we almost can't relate to this. Here we are in this beautiful bubble, in this 48114 zip code, in this upper Midwest setting, and nobody's bothering us. That day may come when that's not true. So here's a thought. Observation number one, God allows suffering and struggle into our lives so that we can witness for our faith. And if we suffer persecution, that can be God's way of giving us the chance to demonstrate that we belong to Christ. You may say, well, I don't know what that means because I'm not getting a lot of persecution. Okay, but even on the job, 
in the nurse's lounge, at the school, in the teacher's lounge, in the office, or painting a house with a couple other guys, and you get talking about the gospel. And you've seen it, and I've seen it too. People who reject the gospel look at you as if you are from Mars. They just don't get it. That's the chance to do a little bit of suffering, even if it's just emotional suffering for your faith. But look at this guy that we're studying, Saul. He's breathing out murderous threats. He went to the high priest and he asked for letters to the synagogues in Damascus. Why? Because he has heard that some people are damaging his religion. These people actually believe that some dead, uncertified, uncredentialed, unofficial, unaccepted rabbi named Jesus came back to life and Saul is saying, it's not true, I don't believe it. And I'm going to put a stop to it like a marine special force or an army special force who breaks in, breaks down doors to find the bad guys. He's going around breaking down doors. If he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he'd take them as prisoners back to Jerusalem. He was so obsessed with putting an end to this myth of Christ. This is a man in transition. And everyone around him is suffering the consequences. You've got a really mean business with Jesus in order to put up with that, because if Saul breaks down your door and says, do you believe in Christ as the Messiah, you're going to be faced with that moment. Well, I don't know. I think I do, yes. You might be tempted. I might be tempted to say, no, I don't. No, I don't. My wife tells a story about years ago when we were first saved, hearing some missionaries bring their message in our little church back in New York, and one of them talked about a scene where some new believers in this country where they were were captured by these rebels, and they were wearing little metal crosses, and the rebels made them take the crosses and shove them down their throat and swallow them, unless they renounced Christ. And Donna said, I remember thinking, I would renounce Christ. I'm too afraid to ever do something like that. Talk is cheap. Anyway, our faith may cost us something, and Paul's making that clear. Observation number two, when sharing your faith with unbelieving friends and family, remember that unless and until they experience the risen Christ, they just won't get it. You and I can talk until we turn plaid to someone about our belief in Jesus. If they don't experience the risen Christ, nothing will happen. I'm in dialogue right now with someone I respect, a guy I know since high school, so 1800s or something. And I'm a strong Christian, and he's an atheist. And he writes back to me, and he says, well, I'm very interested in the writings of Dan Brown, that guy that wrote all that fictional stuff about Jesus, none of which is accurate. And I said, and Dan Brown didn't go to the cross for you, my friend. You need to experience Christ, and until you do, you'll have that posture. That was Paul. Except that, look what happened. On his way to Damascus, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. This is marvelous to contemplate this. He couldn't even look at it. In fact, it blinds him. We'll see it blinds him. Remember last summer when everyone was out in the yards looking up the eclipse? Even so, with all the talk about the glasses and the need to be careful, people were blinded. Jesus is the light of the world. Do you remember the transfiguration scene? Six days after six days, Jesus took with him. I just backed up to Matthew's gospel. He took Peter and James and John, his brother, and he led them up to a high mountain, and there he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. They could barely look at him. You know, when you, if you slip away today, or I do, and you go into the presence of Christ, you won't see Jesus just sort of hanging around in a robe giving you a big hug. You'll see the brightest light you've ever seen. Someone say amen. amen. So look what happened. Saul, Paul, falls to the ground. He heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Whenever you see that in the Old Testament, it's God speaking. When God says the name twice, that, that means that's God speaking, okay? Okay, so Mark, if you hear Mark, Mark, listen up, right? It's God speaking. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Well, this is amazing. We realize later on that the men who are with Paul hear this, but they don't see the light. Isn't that sweet of God? Think about that. I don't know who those guys were. I don't know what they're about. I don't know if anybody cares about them. We don't even know their names, but God did not let, let them be blinded by the light, or they all would have been blind. They don't see that, but he does. Why do you persecute me? Jesus is about to save this man. 
So I want to just go back and touch on a little good Reformed theology, friends. If you are a Christian today, I don't, it doesn't matter how much you want to argue about these doctrines, if you are a Christian, you are only a Christian because God opened your heart and gave you a vision of Christ saved, resurrected. You would never believe in him. He's unbelievable. When I speak that message again to some unbelieving friends, one says it's the craziest story I ever heard. I said, you're right. Who could possibly believe that God took on flesh, went to the cross, was crucified, buried, and then raised from the dead? It's an unbelievable story. You would never believe it if Jesus didn't do the supernatural in your life. And that's what he's doing here with Saul. Why do you persecute me? You remember, go back to Luke chapter 10. All things have been committed to me by my Father. All things. And no one knows who the Son is except the Father. No one knows who the Father is except the Son. And those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Back up the tape. Finish the year 2017 and me with you rejoicing and celebrating if you are saved because he did it all by his grace had nothing to do with our reasoning. You may say, I reasoned it out. Sure you did. That's because he opened your mind. Look what that says. <laughs> Reveal him. The Greek word is apocalypto. Explosions. <laughs> uncovering. Unless God uncovers it, unless he opens my eyes, unless God uncovers the gospel, I will never grasp it. Though there's Saul saying, well, what, he's Jesus saying, what are you persecuting me? And there's poor Saul. Gener observation number three. When the people of Christ are harmed, Jesus insists that he himself is harmed, that he himself is persecuted. Even today, Jesus knows of everyone's suffering, and he feels their pain. Some will say, oh, that can't be. He's sitting up the right hand of God the Father in his long robe, and they're bringing him whatever he wants, and it's all glory there. Yeah, it is. I can't explain it. But if you are reviled for the gospel, made uncomfortable for it, he has that feeling with you. He knows about it. Now we have our most religious man of all time. And Jesus has revealed himself and he has to say this, so who are you? Saul, you're telling me you're the most religious man in Jerusalem and you have to ask, who is he? You, you, you know, you met God in the doorway and you said, who are you? I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now he's blind and he falls down and they have to lead him into the village. Look at the power of that. This is no metaphor, once again. This is literal. He can't see. You know why? Because his eyes are ruined. <clears throat> There's a word for it. It's called retina something apathy. It's really quite an interesting word. It's last summer. If you look into that eclipse with no glasses, do it for about 90 seconds. You're never going to see the rest of your life. His eyes just got burned up. They're, they're ruined. They're not just, he didn't just like get a little glare a couple minutes to feel better. He's, he's blind. And though they lead him like a child. This one who was on the racetrack going a million miles an hour, and then they lead him like a child, like this. And then the Spirit of God comes. In Damascus, there was a disciple, Ananias, not the guy we meet later. The, the dishonest one, different Ananias. The Lord calls to him in a vision. He's, yes, Lord. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus whose name is Saul. He's praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias, that's you, come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. And it's a wonderful passage. Time wouldn't allow me to unfold it. But Ananias says, you don't mean this, do you, Lord? Do you know who that guy is? That's the guy that's persecuting the church. He's going around dragging men and women and their families out of their households. You don't really want me to do this, do you, Lord? If it was today, we'd all be texting, hey, watch for this guy named Saul. Don't let him in your door. The man's not right. And, and, and Jesus tells him, just do what I say, okay? Because God is filled with surprises. Sometimes God does the very thing we are certain he would not do. Or if we admit it, we, we say, well, he shouldn't have done it that way. I mean, I've never done that, and you've never done it, but a lot of Christians think that. You know, he shouldn't have done it that way. And we see in Acts 17, Ananias, he obeyed. He went to the house all the while. He's thinking, oh, brother, why am I doing this? Placing his hands on Saul. He calls him Brother which is interesting and affectionate. Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, I don't know how he knows that, as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is marvelous. Immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes. Immediately, the retinas in his eyes were healed. Immediately, the light came back in. He could see, and he got up and he said, I need to be baptized. It's marvelous. He sees everything now with new eyes. 
It's a great transition story. Okay, so what could we draw from this then? Well, what's practical here is that God is at work in our lives. While we're on the journey, he may turn us around and turn us around dramatically. We need to understand that God doesn't always do things our way. He may even surprise us, observation number five, in order to be saved and to walk more closely with the Lord, he has to give us new vision. And sometimes he corrects our vision. I've had many Christians tell me over the years, and I myself can testify that there were times when I was headed that way when God spoke to me, gave me new vision, got me on the right track, and sent me in another direction. Because he is the life-changing Jesus. This transition we're experiencing as a church or as individuals or in Donna in my life, it's a transition that is rooted in his grace. He knows you. He knows who you are. I'm near closure, but not yet, not quite yet. We took a bunch of kids to the uh, Pistons game the other night. It cost me $500 to see them lose by 50 points. <laughs> oh man, what's that, $10 a point or something? Beautiful big new arena that they have. Anybody been there? Who's been there in the new arena? No kidding. There we go. Good, Jim. It was fun. They've got a, the biggest scoreboard screen hanging in the middle of the place in the world. It is. It's literally, it's gigantic, right, Jim? It's gigantic. You don't even have to watch the guys. I mean, they look like, when you've got cheap seats, they look like they're on Mars. You can just watch the thing. Well, what do you think happened at halftime? My wife is so sweet. At halftime, scrolling across the thing, come the words, congratulations, Pastor Albert, I'm your 26 years at Cornerstone. <laughs> 20,000 people in this arena, and my name's on the screen. <laughs> and not for making a three-pointer or anything, just my name. I thought, that's just like God. You see, there's 20,000 people, and he picks me out. If you're safe, he picked you out. You do not believe in John 10, Jesus said. You do not believe. You know why you don't believe? Because you're not my sheep. My sheep get the message. I thought, oh, what a beautiful picture of salvation, how God picked me out. This is about him and his grace and his mercy and Saul. There were a dozen men, a hundred men like Saul, filled up with themselves and all their erroneous doctrines. But he picked him out. He picked you out of your safe. Give glory to God. He picks us out when we are saved. Because he changes lives. So back to our question as we move to closure here. We think. January of 1992, this pulpit began a series of sermons. What was the name of that series? Anybody remember? Was anybody here? <laughs> was anybody here who remembers? Was anybody awake? Gosh, I am. What a great effect. It was called The Life-Changing Jesus, an eight-part sermon series beginning January 26, 1992. It was excellent. <laughs> I kind of liked it. I want to end with a story. It's a true story. Please forgive me that I have to talk about myself again for a minute. This is really fun. This is not, I'm not trying to impress you. This is just a great, this is just a great example. Jesus changes lives. Do you believe that? Well, you wouldn't know it from that amen, i got to tell you. <laughs> Jesus changes lives, amen? amen? I mean, you want to tell somebody that Jesus changes lives. Everybody should be walking around with a card with their picture on it and their phone number. Say, here, talk to me if you want to talk about Jesus. What's the worst that can happen? The guy says, you're nuts. Get out of here. <laughs> Last night at 8 o'clock, I went to Kroger for vanilla ice cream. I said, Donna, where's the vanilla ice cream? She said, I don't know. You eat it all the time. Go get some. So I read over there, it's cold and dark, it's very dark. And as I'm walking up to Kroger, I hear the bell ringing for the uh, Salvation Army thing, right? It's going like that, but there's nobody there. <laughs> I'm thinking, this is kind of cool, they have that thing on a tape or something. There's a disc playing, ding, 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 we couldn't get anybody to ring, it's too cold and dark out here. But I get up really close and there's this little gal, she's about, ah, oh, she's a little mite. I mean, young woman about 17 or 18 and she's all huddled up against the 
the brickwork there, and she's like this. So you are right in there? She just looks at me, she says, yeah, she's ringing at me. I'm just cold. I said, oh, well, how long's your shift? She said, nine o'clock, it's eight o'clock. I said, oh, poor thing. I can't offer you my coat because I don't have a coat. I, I run warm, but she's cold. She's like, I said, you want me to get you a coffee? She said, yeah. You thought she died and went to heaven, you know? Yeah, I'll get you a coffee. I said, all right, I'll do that. Well, that's the one store in the whole zip code that doesn't have... I go into the city and go, where's the coffee? It's over there in the can. I said, no, I mean coffee that's already made up. Oh, we don't have any of that. What kind of store is this? Get with it. We, everybody's got a coffee bar these days except you guys. So I come out and I say to the girl, um, I'll be back. She goes, okay. So I go to the service station that, around the bend there, and right as I'm pulling in, they put the lights out. I said, you know, Jesus, you're not being a lot of help right about now. I mean, in your sovereignty, you couldn't have had him stay another minute. Now I'm feeling like a martyr, right? Not quite, but, you know, despite what my son said, I'm a very nice guy. I don't pull people out of cars and beat them up and stuff. So I went all the way down to McDonald's and I got a coffee and it, with cream and sugar. And I drove back. I'm happy. It was fun. I'm having fun doing this. I pull back in. And she's looking at me like, she can't believe I did this. And I pull up and she comes out and says, thank you very much. And I give her the coffee mug with my card. It says, uh, my name is a senior pastor. I'm going to get new cards. It used to be senior pastor. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> and it's, it's got my phone number and my, you know, my name and my email. It's got all kinds of stuff. Why did I do that? I gave her the card. I said, listen, here's your coffee. And uh, thanks for your work for the, the thing with the bell. It's cool. And I said, if ever you want to talk about Jesus, I want you to call me, okay? She goes, yeah, okay. Everybody in here should have a card with your name and your phone number, an email. When you meet strangers, say, do you know the Lord? Well, good. Call me when you want to talk about the Lord. Because you know what? This world we're living in, the, the, you know it, right? It's dark and it's cold, and people are huddling up against the brick wall, and they're hiding out, and it's about to get worse. Every day, it's about to get worse. Watch what's coming the next few weeks. All these so-called leaders are turned out to be perverts and predators. They're all over the place. Coaches, teachers, congressmen, all of them. Violent people, we've been sowing violence, now we're reaping it. We've been sowing perversion, now we're reaping it. And people who don't know Christ are like this, huddling against the wall. And you want to go to them and say, what you have to do is surrender your life to the Son of God. I didn't say he's going to take away all the violence or the perversion and make life happy. You might be martyred before it's over, but you want to make sure you know Jesus and you have surrendered your life, as did Paul. Transition your life from lostness to foundness. Pray with me, please. I pray, Father, that before this day ends, or this week ends, you'll give everyone here, starting with me, a chance to talk to someone who doesn't know the Son of God, even Jesus. Let us experience what Paul did, Jesus. Let us see your light, but remain able to see. Show us your light, but let us not be blinded. We chase after you, Jesus. We're looking after you as hard as we can. We want to surrender ourselves to you and be good, strong witnesses. Thank you for what you did in Saul and Paul's life. And thank you for the Son of God, and we pray in his name.